In your Bible tonight, the book of Revelation, chapter number 17, or we're going to get there in a few moments at least, not immediately. Revelation chapter 17. Well, ever since COVID began, about a year ago now, we've been hearing of the Great Reset. If you read the news or if you get on the internet and look at YouTube or anything like that, you're going to see it over and over. There must be a thousand videos on YouTube right now uh, dealing with some aspect of the Great Reset. Government and world leaders have said that because of the epidemic, the pandemic, that things will never go back to normal. We hear the term, the new normal, and we're even encouraged to accept the new normal. And there's a group of world leaders who see, though, the pandemic as an opportunity to further their vision of a global government, a one world government. For years, you've heard about globalism and many of the leaders of the United States were globalists. Their vision for the future was a global economy, a global military, a uh, global government, and many people in the religious realm have dreamed of a global religion of some type. The leader of this movement today, at least the intellectual leader of it, is a man named Klaus Schwab. He is a German. He is an author, an economist, an engineer, quite an impressive man. He was born back in the 1930s. He's getting older now. But he wrote the book, COVID-19, The Great Reset. And for seven weeks, this is the seventh week, I've spoken from uh, this subject. Now, this book is not my Bible by any means, but I read most of the book. I perused all of it. It's about 280 pages or so. And it's the globalist plan following uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Klaus Schwab heads up uh, an organization that's called the World Economic Forum. They meet every year in Davos, Switzerland. They just met about two or three weeks ago. And if you were listening to the news, you heard them refer to it. These 3,000 members of this very exclusive club, because that's what it is, are people like Prince Charles. I don't know if I've mentioned him in this or not, but he is very much at the forefront, this whole, whole globalist movement. Angela Merkel, the Prime Ministeress of Germany. Emmanuel Macron, who is the President of the nation of France right now. George Soros, who you've heard about as a multi-billionaire who finances just about every leftist project in the United States. He's got money in it in some way. He's big in this, as you might suppose. My favorite of all is Dr. Fauci. <laughs> Need I say more? The medical doctor who follows the science and changes his mind every three days. Dr. Fauci, he's a member of this. And um, Bill Gates is a member, not surprisingly. John Kerry, oh, you knew he'd be there. And these people promote this whole globalist agenda they have for many years. It includes socialism, Marxism, global government. In my opinion, it is a very godless, godless system. Now, the other groups now are coming under the umbrella of this. The World Economic Forum is becoming the leader in this whole movement. Groups like Agenda 21, Agenda 2030. And I'm not talking about the movement. I'm talking there is an organization called the Green New Deal. Now, nobody can be a nationalist. Nobody could be an American who says America first and be a part of this. They just couldn't. It's in opposition. And I read a very interesting development this week. I don't know if you read it in the 
in the um, news or not. But somehow Putin over in Russia has got, gotten involved in this. And he told them, he basically said, I'm not playing your game. I'm for Russia. I'm not a globalist. I am for Mother Russia, my home, my home country. And this week also, if you were reading the news, you heard our own president, President Biden, and he is now on the record. He said, I believe in the global system. I believe in the global system, our president. What is their agenda? Their agenda is to replace national sovereignty of various nations with global governance. Their agenda is to replace the free enterprise system with socialism. I showed you their video, and they said on it, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Their agenda is to abolish Christianity. You read this book through, the word God is not in at one time, or Christ, or Christianity. In other words, it's a plan that says Christianity is irrelevant. Put it on the side, put it on the shelf, and uh, we don't need to worry in the new world about Christianity. Their agenda is equity. That's a very subtle thing that's happening. When you listen now to politicians, many of them, instead of using the term equality, which every Christian is for equality. We believe everybody ought to have an equal opportunity, right? We want a level playing field for every person. But equity doesn't mean equality, so don't confuse the two. Equity means that everybody has the same amount. So you take from those who have to give to those who don't have, regardless of the circumstances. And equity is not equal opportunity, it's equal result. It means there will not be any competition. So without competition, the question will be, will there ever be even improvement in things? So this is man's plan. This is the best that humanism can do. Now, how significant is it in the scheme of biblical prophecy? I don't know yet. No one can say, authoritatively, and I don't want to presume that I don't want you to think I'm saying that. I don't want anybody to walk out of here and say, you know, I listened to the pastor. I think he thinks that uh, this is uh, the plan for the Antichrist. No, here's what I think. I think that possibly this is one of a series of events that's going to set the stage for the Great Tribulation. Let me say that again. This is man's plan, and it possibly is one, one of a series of events that will set the stage for the Great Tribulation period. This at least has the mindset of the Tribulation, the mindset of the Antichrist and the events that we see prophetically in the Scripture. I remind you again, one-third of your Bible is prophetic. One out of every three pages or 27%, I hear different estimates, 27 to 33%. But a, a great portion of the Bible is prophetic. A pastor can't be faithful to giving his people the whole counsel of God and ignore one-third of the Bible or 25% of the Bible even. We've got to deal with the prophetic scriptures. And the Lord gave them to us so we would know. Now, again, I remind you, though, that in the book of Daniel, Daniel said that the book is sealed. His book, and he was speaking of prophecy in general, some of prophecy is sealed until the end time. What did he mean with that? by that? He meant that as we approach an event, God gives light on that. He gives insight from his Holy Spirit into the Scripture, and we see things that we didn't see before those circumstances uh, conspired. And so there, uh, uh, many people didn't see uh, uh, some of the events that have surrounded Israel, but after Israel became a nation and events began to conspire there, well, then people said, oh, that sounds like this verse over here. 
And so as events transpire throughout history, we know that God gives insight into his already written word of prophecy. Prophecy is just history that's pre-written. History that is pre-written. God wrote it down before it happened because he knows the end from the beginning. Now, in your Bible, we've been looking here at Revelation 12 and 13 the last few weeks. And in Revelation 12, we saw a panoramic view here. By panoramic, I mean it's like God took his camera, pulled it way back, and he looked at the big picture. He put into it all of history from the beginning to the end of human history. And the panoramic view is is he looked at all of history and he looks at it from an eternal standpoint because he is eternal. You and I are, we're captives of time. We can only see one thing at a time. But God sees the whole panoramic scope, the whole panoramic view of history. And so he flashes back and forth in the book of Revelation. And that's what makes the book of Revelation very, very hard in some places because you don't know what time period it's referring to. And so in Revelation 12, we saw a woman. And we find out the woman gives birth to a child. And we find out that the child is the same one who's going to come to the earth one day and rule with a rod of iron. So that describes Jesus Christ. So we have the mother of Jesus Christ, which is it's not talking about Mary. It's talking about a nation, Israel. Israel, the nation has a child who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we read about a dragon who comes on the scene, and it tells us specifically. It even gives his name, Satan, the adversary, that old serpent, the devil. He comes on the scene, and he tries to kill the child, and he tries to kill the woman. He tries to do away with the woman. And we've seen that down through history, haven't we? Then we come to chapter 13. And in chapter 13, if I were to just give it a heading, I would say Revelation chapter 13 is where Satan is setting up his administration for the final world empire of the beast. Satan is choosing the players. He's setting up his administration. And who is in his administration? His unholy trinity that I told you about last week. Just like we know there is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is a satanic trinity. Satan himself is trying to replace God. Then there is the beast, the Antichrist, who is seeking to replace the Lord Jesus. And the third person is the false prophet of Revelation 13. And the false prophet is one who is the replacement in Satan's mind of the Holy Spirit. He's a rel- the false prophet, of course, is a religious leader. So we have Satan's administration set now for him to create his one world final empire. And we turn to chapter 17. The reason I'm skipping 14, 15, and 16 is they deal with different subjects altogether. They are parenthetical. It's like a big parenthesis of three chapters that we have here. And so we go to chapter 17, and I think the best way for me to handle it is not even try to outline it right now, but just to read through it with you and give you the sense of it as best. I've studied a lot. I hope I can make it simple. It's pretty involved. Follow with me in your Bible, and I think you'll, you'll be able to see it. In verse number one, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials. This refers back to chapter 15 and 16, where God gave an angel seven vials, and he poured out the contents of those vials upon the earth, and there are seven judgments upon the earth. And you've read about those. The angel said to John, come hither. John, I want to show you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And so now we're using symbolic language. Who is this whore? What does he mean by sitteth upon waters? 
Well, the angel is referring to the judgment of this woman called, he calls her a whore. We know what that word means. A whore is a woman who is adulterous, a woman who engages in fornication, a woman who is unfaithful to her husband. She's disloyal. And we also find this idea of adultery and whoredom all through the Old Testament being used in a spiritual sense. So we talk about idolatry, worshiping other gods. We talk about that as spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. God uses that metaphor all through the Old Testament. He's saying, I am your husband, people of God, specifically Israel. I am your husband. You are betrothed to me. We have a personal, intimate relationship. And if you worship other gods, you have, you, you have practiced spiritual immorality, fornication with, in a spiritual sense. And he was always saying that to the nation of Israel. In fact, there's a whole book in the Bible, the book of Hosea, that deals with that subject throughout. That's a, a, a very interesting study in itself. And so this angel says, John, come here. I'm going to show you how this whore is going to be judged. He said, now she sits upon many waters. Let your eye go over to verse 15. And he later on says to John, the waters that you saw where the whore sitteth are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. So the waters here refer to the population of the earth. And this whore, this harlot woman, is sitting upon the population of the entire world at this time. So we know now this is the final stage, if you will, of Gentile power, the last empire that's going to exist upon the earth. Now, in verse 2, it tells us about her. This woman is called a harlot because she's committed fornication with the kings of the earth. The kings of the earth would be political leaders, wouldn't it? So she is in some sort of a licentious relationship with the political powers that be. And if you'll notice also in verse 2, she has affected everyone. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk. They're intoxicated with the wine of her fornication. She has infected and affected every single person that lives upon the earth, this woman, whoever she is. Now, in verse 3, we see this panoramic view again. Verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And what he really is saying, he's carrying me backwards in time. We're going to find out why I say that in a moment. He carried me in the spirit. So this is not a literal carrying. This is a spiritual experience that he has. He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw, and he's talking now about this harlot woman. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. So this woman is seated on this beast, and boy, there's thousands of pictures that you can have of that, and they all are grotesque, but there, there is a beast with seven heads. It meets the description that we've been reading in the Scripture. And on it is the woman. She's riding the beast, if you will. And you will notice there that he carries me in the spirit. And I saw a woman upon a scarlet beast full of the names of blasphemy. Well, that's an anti-God statement there if there ever was one, huh? And the beast has seven heads and ten horns. Ah, where have we seen that before? Well, we've seen it all the way through here. Go back with me to Revelation chapter uh, 13 and verse, um, let's see, 
uh, verse 13 and verse 1, or chapter 13 and verse 1. Out of the sea I saw a beast having seven heads and ten horns there. So it's the same beast. Who is that beast? We know now. We've proven that that beast is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is being ridden by this woman. What do those seven heads represent for some of you who might not have been here in previous sessions? Those seven heads represent seven Gentile um, empires that have existed throughout history. Empires that every one of them have been against the people of God, against the nation of Israel, against God's work himself. And the woman, so the seven, the seven heads mean that this beast is a composite of all of the great empires of the past. All their sins, all their wickedness, all their evil, it's all accumulated here in this beast, this antichrist figure. And the woman is sitting on it, riding it. When a person rides an animal like that or whatever, a horse or whatever, they're, they're in control, aren't they? So the woman, whoever she is and whatever she is, she seems to be, if not totally controlling the beast, she's riding him. She's related to him. She's, she's a part of what he's doing now. And John says, they carried me back. They carried me into the wilderness, and I saw the woman upon the scarlet-colored beast. Scarlet, what does that mean? Well, in the Bible, scarlet represents, among other things, sin. Do you remember the verse in Isaiah that says that though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow? Scarlet is always associated with uh, immorality, adultery, sexual sin, grievous sins of various kinds in the Bible. And so the woman is riding a scarlet-colored beast, the seven heads representing the past great kingdoms of history. His names are full of blasphemy, so he has the antichrist, anti-God spirit. He opposes everything that's holy, everything that's true, and everything that's good. And in verse 3, he has ten horns as well, seven heads and ten horns. And so those ten horns represent the ten kingdoms that are going to be coming in the future. So this is panoramic. This covers the whole scheme of time. Now go to verse 4 and let's look, about, uh, let's look at the woman. The woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Purple is the color of kings, of rulers, of power. Scarlet, as I said, represents in most places in the Bible sin. She's decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. She has a golden cup in her hand, and the cup is full of abomination. Make a note there in your Bible, the word abomination is the same word sometimes translated idolatry. She's opulently, expensively dressed, but it's flashy dress. It's dressed like a harlot would have. And she has a golden cup in her hand, and it's full of idolatry and the filthiness of her fornication. So we have idolatry from abomination, and we have fornication. That would be adultery, idolatry and adultery immorality, if you will. So this is quite a woman here. This is a woman who believes in the worship of idols and is grossly immoral here. And she's dressing like a harlot. She's dressing to attract men, if you will. And in verse 5, it says, her name is on her forehead. And it gives her name. All capital letters in your Bible. Mystery Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations or idol worship of the earth. Now, he's taken us back, and the phrase Mystery Babylon takes us back over time, panoramic. 
We go way, way back. We go back to the time of Christ. We go back before Christ. We go back to the establishment of the nation of Israel. We go back, we go clear back to Abraham. We go back before Abraham a little bit. And you wonder now, why did I preach a message on Genesis 10, the Tower of Babel, and Nimrod, the second message I preached in the series? Well, we're going back to that right now. That's what Mystery Babylon represents. Mystery Babylon is the phrase that identifies this woman with what happened at the Tower of Babel. What happened at the Tower of Babel? There was a man named Nimrod. He became a powerful, powerful political leader. And he built this great tower, this ziggurat. And the ziggurat was going up as high as you could to heaven with a zodiac on top. And it was a way to go and worship the stars and really demon spirits, if you will. And he tried to bring everybody there. And you know the story. He was creating a one world empire himself way back there. He believed in globalism. He was the first globalist. And you know how God confused their languages and scattered them throughout the whole earth. It displeased the Lord what he was doing because the Lord didn't want that then and the Lord doesn't want that now. And so this takes us back, verse 5, to the Tower of Babel. And Babel is the place where all the false religions, the pagan religions, the anti-God belief systems, that's where it started back there at the Tower of Babel. All of the occultic beliefs, the pagan beliefs, all of them came from that time. Occultism, pantheism, astrology, what we call today New Age, the worship of idols. It all started in Genesis chapter 10 with the Tower of Babel, the mystery Babylon. Now, if you'll trace that and you come on through, I won't try to take you through the Bible on this, just just history. If you come on down through time, that city, Babel, became, or Babel, if you want to call it that, that became Babylon, which is now located in Iraq. And it became the greatest city in the whole world. And it grew and grew and became more powerful and powerful until finally you come to the book of Daniel and you have Nebuchadnezzar, the king, ruling, and he's ruling over the civilized world. It's a worldwide empire, Babylon. But do you know what Babylon, above all, is known for and famous for? Is its demonic and occultic worship. It became, in fact, at the end of revolution, it's called the whole of every foul bird. In other words, it has become a filthy place and the birds represent Satan. And this has become the vilest place in the whole world, this Babylon. And so this woman is, he's looking at her and she's a continuation in the last days of that whole religious concept that was born years ago in Babel. Notice in verse 6, the woman is drunken with the blood of the saints, intoxicated with the blood of God's people, the saints of God, and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, which means this woman hates Christians which means this woman who appears in the middle of the, tribu- of the great tribulation period, sometime between three and a half and seven years of the tribulation period, what that means is there's going to be a great persecution of Christian people. So great that this woman is drunk. She's intoxicated on the blood of the saints and the martyrs who are going to die during that awful time of history. Look at John's response. At the end of verse 6, I wondered with great admiration. Now, 
we're reading from a King James Bible here. And the King James word for admiration would be, uh, we, would, we would say amazement or to be overwhelmed. And John said, I looked at this scene, this woman who goes all the way back, this system that she represents, goes all the way back to Genesis 10, the Tower of Babel. And here I see her at the end of time, drunk on the blood of God's people, this ungodly system. And John said, I stood back. It overwhelmed me. It amazed me. I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing with my eyes. Now, let's think then about where we are. And as I said, in chapter 13 here, we saw the very same beast. It begins with a man, and the man grows in his power until the man becomes an empire. So the beast, when you see the word beast here, it represents two things. It represents an empire, a great political power, and it represents a man individually, the Antichrist, who is an individual like we. In verse 7, the angel comes back and speaks again to, um, to John. Let me get over here in the right place. And the angel said to me, Wherefore did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of this woman and of the beast which carrieth her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Verse 8, the beast that you saw, the beast that you saw was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, last week I skipped all those analogies to things like that. There are several references like that. And I didn't mention them. And this week somebody called me or emailed me or something and said, well, you skipped a couple verses I wonder about there. And those verses deal with the beast being wounded and all that. So go back and let me, now that we're at this point, I'm ready to uh, take that on here. Revelation chapter number 13, it has some strange verses here. Actually, let's go back to chapter 11. In chapter 11 and verse 7, we see the very first mention of the beast in the, in the book of Revelation. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast, okay, note the words, that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. It's talking about the two witnesses who we think are Elijah and Moses, but we won't get into that right now. But the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit... Note that, note that wording. Now come down to chapter number 13 and look in verse 3. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. Is that talking about the empire or is that talking about the man, the beast, the antichrist himself? But I come down to verse 12 he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and he causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And then if you will go to verse 14, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword and did live. And then you come to chapter 17 and note it's another similar description using the same terminology and so on. The beast that you saw was and is not and shall one day ascend down the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And so you see these constant descriptions here of this beast, something about him, he's wounded, he's wounded in his head, he ceases to exist, and then he comes back again. It's really unclear. I've read every commentary and every scholar that I know on, and the best I can tell you is this, that 
when the Antichrist appears on the scene, the man, that something is going to happen to him. We don't know what it may be. It might be an assassination attempt. Somebody tries to kill him, whatever. But he is gravely wounded, and the wound is in his head. It's a head wound. And he comes, uh, he appears to die. I don't know if he dies or not because I don't know if the Bible is using symbolic language or if it's using literal terms here. I question that he truly, really dies fully because I've never believed that Satan has the power to bestow life to raise people from the dead. Now, there's a lot of good Bible scholars that believe that he literally, that, that the beast dies from this wound and that he is resurrected by the devil if there's some sort of supernatural occurrence here, some miracle. I personally think the devil is a deceiver and it's a fake. But for whatever, that's, that's the best explanation I think I or maybe anybody else can give you that during the ascendancy of this beast, during the time he's coming to power, something happens. He has some sort of critical wound to his head. He disappears for a time. He is thought to be dead and then he comes back on the scene. It appears he's been resurrected from the grave. Hey, wait a minute. He is the Antichrist. Satan seeks to counterfeit everything God does. If Jesus Christ died and resurrected, why do we not think Satan would also try to have a counterfeit death and resurrection of his, of his Christ? So that's my best explanation to you for that. The beast that was, he existed. He came on the scene. He ascended out of the pit. He ascended into power. But he is not. He died. That's in verse 8b. And yet, he is. A satanic miracle, whether real or fake, I can't say for sure. And so the Antichrist was, is not, but he is going to ascend to power and then he's going to be destroyed in perdition here, it says. Well, let's go to verse 9. Verse 9 here, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, the city of Rome sits on seven mountains, seven hills. It's known worldwide as the city of seven hills. And all probably half or more of the evangelical uh, commentaries and scholars would say that this refers to Rome. And they equate Rome with Roman Catholicism. The reformers especially did that. Martin Luther, John Calvin, boy, they just, you know, they called the Pope was the beast and the Roman Catholic Church was the, the, the religious system. And... Uh, the whore riding the beast was the church. I mean, they were, they were pretty strong on this. I'm not afraid to say that if it's true, but I don't believe that's a good interpretation of that. And the reason I don't is because in the Bible, mountains most of the time refer to kingdoms. And it's not talking about a city here in the context. It's talking about kings and empires and the beast I tend to think it's talking about the seven heads. That's the empires are seven mountains or great empire governments. And the woman sits on the beast, which is a composite of all of those. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. Now, the seven kings and the seven mountains are the seven heads, the same thing, of the past. And five of the kings are fallen, meaning they're gone. They're in history. Who would they be? Well, that would be the kings of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The five of the great empires, worldwide empires. And one is 
present tense. The one who is would be the one current with John that existed right with John. And so that would be the Roman Empire. And the other is not yet come. There's going to be another empire come. And when he cometh, he will only continue for a short space. Now, I believe that refers to a revived Roman Empire. And the reason I do is if you go back to Daniel's image that we studied, he has the kingdoms, you know, Babylon, and then Medo-Persia, and then Greece, and then down in the legs, Rome. And as you go down, you're going, coming forward in history. And the feet are made of what? Clay and iron. And so they're different than the legs. The legs are iron. Rome at its peak. Rome at the time John wrote this. And then down in the bottom, in the feet, it becomes a different empire, but bearing the same traits as the old empire. And then the stone that was cut out of the mountain kingdom of God comes rolling over the feet and crushes the feet. And the whole man-made image of empires and powers, political systems, falls on its face. And so the kingdom of the Lord then, it says the kingdom of the stone grows and becomes a great mountain. You remember that? And it fills the earth. So the idea of the mountain, I don't, I don't see it as being a city. I see it as being a part of his description of these, of these empires, if you will. Now, it gets real interesting real quick, and we're about to finish it up. There are seven kings. Five of them are fallen, the five past empires, the one that is right now, Rome, and the one that is to come. And it's only, the one that is to come is only going to continue a short space, actually less than three and a half years of the tribulation period. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. And the beast empire will be the eighth great world empire. He is of the seven, which means he has all the qualities and characteristics of the, of the first seven. But he's unique. And he continues until he goes into destruction or perdition. And the ten horns which you saw are the ten kings that will give their allegiance to the Antichrist when he comes. We don't know where exactly those kings will rule over. We don't know what nations exactly they'll rule over. We do know that it appears that Europe is coming back together and forming in the European Union. Will it be ten nations of Europe or will it be ten nations from other places? Nobody can say for sure. But there's going to be ten kings who administer this worldwide empire for the beast. And if you'll continue in verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are the ten kings of these ten kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive power as kings for one hour, the brief time that the beast is going to rule the world. They have one mind. They all think alike. They give their power and strength to the beast. They're going to make war with the lamb. That's with Jesus Christ. And we'll look at that in chapter 19. That's the battle of Armageddon. They will make war with the lamb, and the lamb, of course, will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And down in verse 16, and the ten horns, that, those are kings, according to verse number 14. The ten kings which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. They're going to turn against this religious system symbolized by this woman. And they're going to make her desolate and naked. And they're going to eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So this harlot religious system 
riding on controlling the beast for a very brief period of time here, but helping this world empire come into place. The ten kings that are under the authority of the Antichrist are going to rise up, and they're going to kill her. I mean, they're going to destroy the religious system that has been carried here by the beast himself. And I like verse 17. I underlined it in my Bible. God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Even though it looks like the beast and the world's godless religious system is in control, verse, tells, verse uh, 17 tells me God is still sovereign. God is still in control. He puts it in the heart. He puts it in the heart of these ten kings to rise up against this apostate religious system that's coming and to fulfill his will. And they'll do that until the words of the Lord will be fulfilled. Now, let me try to put all this together in three minutes. So the Great Reset is a secular approach to bringing about a world government. God is not mentioned, as I said. I think the word religion might be in here once, but I'm, I don't, I'm not even sure of that. Now, we found out last week that Satan himself believes you can't build a world power without religion. You need religion to unify the people. Secular empires cannot exist very long because they don't have any ultimate unifying power. People's ultimate belief systems are in all different directions until they're unified by, by religion. And so he gets this second religious, this second beast, this religious leader, the, the, the false prophet. We talked about him last week. And he creates this worldwide religious system. The system is pictured in chapter 17 as the great whore, the harlot, a system of worldwide godless, anti-God religion, riding upon the back of the beast, the worldwide political system. And the woman represents this system that incorporates all the religions of the past, and she allies with the beast, the Antichrist, until finally the kings, the political leaders, revolt against her and destroy her. But the beast still is in power. And this woman, drunken with the blood of the saints, tells me that God's people that are left upon the earth, not left upon the earth, that, come, that become Christians on the earth during the tribulation period, that they're going to face the awfulest bloodbath and persecution that Christians have ever faced in all of history. Now, go out of here tonight with hope. Are we looking for the Antichrist? I hope you're not. Boy, I mean, Christians today are so confused. They're like the little boy who had a sign, a button on his shirt, and it said, I-A-K. And somebody said, what is that stand for? He said, I am confused. The fellow said, that's not how you spell confused. He said, that's how confused I am. <laughs> and Christians are so confused. Somebody told me today, one of our members are listening to my message today, and they thought that, that they believe that people are going to come back as angels, that people come back to the earth as angels. Where did you get that? I know where you got that. You got it from the television set. Touched by an angel 20 years ago. At least watch some up-to-date programs. <laughs> People don't come back as angels. And we're not looking for the Antichrist. We're looking for the Christ. Stand to your feet with me in prayer.